Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online Meeting 235, May 12th. This meeting is being recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. What are we doing today? We're basically picking up where we left off last week and we're doing triage because that's what we're doing as we're trying to finish Wix 4. It's not a terribly exciting agenda, but that's the agenda. We'll see if uh, triage itself can provide a little bit of excitement because it did certainly last week. Uh, in case I didn't say it already, uh, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now, uh, in person. We're, it's great to have Ron, Zach, and Jacob. I feel like we're building a bit of a chat crew. I like it. It's awesome. You're welcome to join us if you can. I know this time slot doesn't work for the entire world. So hopefully I gave enough time there for Bob to get all set to do triage. Ready to go, Bob? Uh, sure, why not? Sure, why not? I love it. Excitement. Uh, we'll start at the top. And we'll work our way down. Fortunately, I, we got through all those ancient, ancient bugs. So I think we're dealing with mostly current. Although 6707 is kind of old. Um, Jan 20. And what this is? Oh. So you couldn't... So Sean couldn't reproduce this way back when. And then found a way to reproduce it. And it's fixed in V4. Right? But so, isn't it bad that you can put an absolute path in there and then burn will try to move a file into that absolute path? Doctor, don't do that. Yes. Or, don't do that, said the doctor. That makes more sense. <laughs> yes, it's bad. Burn actually does this at runtime? Yeah. You could put a full path in there and burn will try to move it. Yeah. This only happens because it's a bind time variable. Bypasses all the checks. It'll cache it into the unverified path and then it'll try to move it from the unverified path to the absolute path that you specify. And then it'll run it from that absolute path. Free feature. Does it run it elevated? Good. That's the problem. Wait, so it takes your file, puts it somewhere on the operating system. Yeah, that's not good. All right. We'll, we'll talk about that one. All right, so can't open solution that contains Wix project and Visual Studio 2022 preview. Um, so this turned out to be an issue. Well, Visual Studio changed something on their side that exposed them to more errors in extensions, Visual Studio extensions. And, um, and Votive was using, is using a very old, system called MPF to communicate with Visual Studio. And that very old system has a very old bug in it that was throwing an exception, which previously was ignored. And then when Visual Studio made this change in 17.2, they became exposed to this bug. And anybody that was using MPF, because the way that you used MPF was Visual, my, Visual Studio gave it to everybody a source code and said, here, copy it, have fun with that. Um, I we helped them understand that everybody that used this old thing, which was the way you used to do it, uh, so that could be a lot, we're gonna have this problem. So they created a workaround inside Visual Studio to catch when this happens for people using old MPF projects with this bug. And we uh, did a fix. Uh, I Fire Giant took time, did a fix, and have a new votive build out that has fixed votive's copy of MPF proj. That's kind of the story behind all of this. The severity dropped on our side to get it done once Visual Studio realized that they were gonna get hit with this bug all over the place and we were just the first one. Um, and we fixed it on our side because, well, probably should. So I guess that's what we did. All right, so that's the story of this one. Um, uh, just gonna let it sit out there for a little bit, hopefully get some people to try it. Although with the Visual Studio fix, 
probably isn't going to do anything. And eventually it will probably push a Visual Studio 2022 votive to the marketplace. Um, so that, uh, I don't know, since we have the fix in here. Anyway, so there's the very long story of what came down to this. And in the end, um, hopefully help you know, Visual Studio handle a lot more extensions crashing all over the place. So that's that one. Oh, we can remove triage from that because that is gone. XE package ARP entry. Sean's been updating the spec on this one. So I expect this is where we might spend some time talking, right? Yeah. Take it away, Sean. Uh, so are we going to talk about the whip or? Uh, it's up to you. How do you want to do it? I didn't bring up the whip here. Let me see. Where is that? Um, it's not linked here, so let's see. Wix toolset dot org documentation. Uh, da, da, da. Whoops. Probably one of the last ones. Arp entry. Ta da. There's the whip. So I guess last time we were talking about bundle packages and making it to where we can uninstall it even if the source isn't in the cache, at least for that bundle, like the package cache for the parent bundle. So then we were talking about using the uninstall string from the ARP entry. So this would be a way to do it for, in general, for XE packages. Mm -hmm. So my original proposal was to try to you provide an ARP entry element underneath the XE package, with the ID, whether it's 64-bit, and then give a variable name that burn will populate with the display version during detect. And then if you scroll down a little bit, I showed an example of how you might use that. So like if you want to do it where it's matching exact version, then you would say that SQL to the version that you know it is. And then you have an install conditions that only installs it if it needs to be installed. And then Bob was bringing up a different way of doing it below where you just want to detect whether it's any version or higher. Although that would mean that when you uninstall the bundle, that would uninstall the package, even if it was a higher version. So that was one way of doing it. And then the other way below was you wouldn't write your own detected condition. Just the presence of the ARP entry would say whether it was detected and you would provide a version range of when it should consider it as present. And then if it's below the range, it's absent and the range is present and above the range would be obsolete. But then my problem with doing that is that you're really changing how an XE package works because you shouldn't provide a detect condition if we're doing that. And then it didn't make sense to me to be running it with the uninstall arguments if you had source because at that point you're really treating the ARP entry as the source of truth. So I'm not sure it makes sense to do anything other than use the uninstall string to uninstall. Yeah, and I mean, that works for both bundles and like, you know, setup packages as well. And like, NSYS wise. For a bundle package, like the uninstall arguments are on top of the normal command line. So like it makes sense to try to run the original source with the uninstall arguments. It might make sense for all these other things too, though. Like the, the ability for the bundle to say, when I uninstall by all means use those uninstall strings and add the I'm in a bundle switch or whatever. Yeah, but for XE packages, uninstall arguments are not additive. You'd have to you'd have to merge the uninstall arguments with the uninstall string from the ARP entry. Correct. You'd have to put them on the end or something. Which might be a bad <laughs> that might not be good. But yeah, if you don't want them, don't add them. I don't know, it's just, it's a, it, it's the one case I could come up with where you might want to add arguments in the bundle 
independent or you know use the uninstall string because that's like if you launch it from admin programs that you're going to use and i add this extra switch to say uninstalling in the context of my bundle switch so you can get both um or you'd have to duplicate them if if uninstall arguments replaced which would be another option you'd have to duplicate them which is not as ideal but also possible i guess ugly though because uninstall string has a full path oh right it it's not a separate thing yeah that's really ugly isn't it yeah i'd be okay with with not allowing uninstall arguments if you have arp entry it it you, you would lose i mean i i see the benefit of being able to add switches and i would <laughs> Let me back up. I'd be fine if we either add the arguments at the end or don't allow them. Um, it, yeah. In the former case, it's like, you know, if it's not going to work, don't do that. Hmm. This is a recurring theme today. Um, the, the, the bundle author is in control, so they could add something that is nonsensical, but don't do that. You can, you can add you can already, things are, You can add arguments through the conditional. I don't remember what the name was, but yep. uninstall arguments are always there, but there's also conditional arguments you can add in a I different remember. way. <laughs> I remember because I did them. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, then I'm completely fine with saying you can't add uninstall arguments to the XE package element if there's an ARP entry element child. That gets us out of the 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 weirdness of uninstall arguments for XE package versus all the others. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. Like your statement before was either don't allow it or append only. And right. I I think that's the right options and Sean's point that there's the already the append option right. arguments right. means that yeah, probably the way to go with uninstall arguments would be to not allow it as an attribute. Yep. It's confusing. Now, detect condition. Yeah, detect condition's weird if you have min version, max version. Because why would you do that? Have min version, max version, and the detect condition. I don't think you would. Yep, agreed. Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, I like min version and max version because it gets us to this flavor of XE package working the same way as MSI package. So that's a win. So, does ARP entry get promoted to a package type? I'm worried about it not being discoverable. Nobody like nobody will think to find it. They'll just go straight to XE package. Um, although you know, too many random elements on XE package aren't going to help its discoverability either. Elements or attributes? Yes, elements okay. and attributes. Um, so it would be an ARP XE package, just for the sake of argument um it have almost all the same things as xc package minus detect condition and uninstall arguments attributes and then add the arp id the win64 the min and max versions right yeah I don't know which way. There's there's some benefit to having a separate element for the package, but the naming of it is really, really, really hard. I don't know if 
Yeah, uh, ARP uh, is very, I mean, we're comfortable with it, yeah, but ARP, it doesn't mean anything to ARP, anybody anymore. Well, those of us in the know, um, I was thinking something like registered XE package, mm. but it's only registered after it's installed, and mm -hmm. this element has to suffice for install as well, so... Hmm. But it sounds like we're definitely leaning towards the min version, max version, instead of uh, making the user craft the detect condition themselves. Uh, completely. Like I said, it, it makes XE pack this kind of XE package work like MSI packages, getting the you know no no detect condition necessary, mm -hmm. and it handles absent and obsolete. So perfect from my perspective. Plus one. Thumbs up. Yeah, I, the the only yes, I think it's I think it's a good thing. I'm I'm struggling a little bit on the how oft how often does someone want to do min version? Well, it's uh, see so how often does someone want to do exact matches versus min version max version? But it's probably not worth the complexity. I don't think people are going to be confused if they have to put the same number in for min version and max version to say exactly this version. Um, although we could have all the inclusive problems um, that we've had in the past. Is that inclusive? Is max version inclusive? Those kinds of problems. Yeah, I kind of skipped over that and just made them both inclusive, but that might not be good enough. It ends up being really hard to define the, the edge of one of them. I think ARP is also an acronym for low-level internet protocol. Well, I'm sure. ARPANET. Um, I'm, I'm really struggling with making this another top-level XE package, given it's an XE package. It, 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 it's really hard to say, oh, you oh you wanted to use one of the uninstall string? Go use this versus, okay, you have an XE package. Oh, you want an uninstall string? Use this um, element, uh, add this element underneath it. And if you do it, then, hey, we take over all this stuff for you and you can't have a detect condition and an uninstall arguments. That feels like you end up in the right place faster than switching to another, trying to find another element, top level package element. But I, a lot of that's because I also can't come up with a good name for the ARP XE package. So that people knew to start there, you know? It's just where I'm struggling. I'm, I'm fine either way. Uh, naming is a problem in both cases. I think as, uh, as whipped, it's probably easier to... <laughs> as whipped, it's an easier naming problem than coming up with a name for the new flavor of XE package. I also do like the idea of keeping it XE package because it reinforces the idea that it is, at its heart, an XE package. It's just a flavor, a different flavor with some different behavior. But I can see the benefits of, of coming up with a new name as well. But I just can't think of a name that is going to be more clarifying. Is there any reason, what if we had let detect condition, what if we allow detect condition, which means that as an author, you chose to take over the detection because it's more complicated than just the uninstall string, for example. You want the uninstall string behavior, but you want the more complex detect condition for some reason. Uh, not sure. I, I'm not thrilled. I mean, I, if you're, so, if you're so, trusting the uninstall string to be correct, I don't know why you wouldn't trust the display version as detection. Or the display version. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe more of a, a skew detection like an additional piece on top of the version. Mm. 
the, you know, I detected this thing, this XE at, at this version, but only if it's pro, not if it's free or, you know, whatever right. enterprise. Write a BA function. Write a BA function. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's, that's probably two edge. It's, it's cause you could always overwrite it with the, um, with the BA. Yeah. Yeah. So no detect condition allowed on these things and uninstall no uninstall arguments attribute. Yep. This version, any higher versions. Yeah. That this version and any higher versions is really dangerous though, isn't it? Yeah, I, mean, that, I wasn't that's very almost, fond of that. That's almost always the wrong answer, isn't it? And you're not going to find out until later. You could, a new ver you install V1 of your bundle with V1 of the X unit, all goes. You install V2 of the bundle, and it installs V2 of the XE, and then you as part of the upgrade, uninstall bundle v1, and it removes xcv2 that bundle v2 just added <laughs> as part of well, its they, uninstall. They really should have different ARP IDs. Uh, I don't know that they do that. Not with Inno. I don't yeah, know about Inno. Most I don't. Uh, yeah, they don't do that. It's a very stable user-defined string. It's like crazy. The collisions that are allowed in that space, but um, so that's really like, do we really want ranges for this? Well, I mean, if they implement patching or whatever, one to two dot two dot one dot three, maybe. Yeah, I guess if it updates out, it's mm, it's interesting. You can definitely get into some bad situations there, pretty easily. Well, what if max version were required? Yeah. And could be empty if we really wanted to allow that. You have to give one. But you can give the empty space. <laughs> I, I, I'd be fine even if you require a, a real version, because if you want to make it, you know, ninety nine dot ninety nine dot ninety nine, you can. Mm -hmm. Or whatever the U long is. Um, yeah, I, I think we probably should require a max version. And I don't know about the inclusivity. Do we need those inclusive bits on top of everything else? Because they're so annoying. Yeah, no, no. It's it's really, really, it's gross. I, I'd be happier if we had, like, you know, um, NuGet style or V6 style. The, you know, brackets and parens to indicate in, inclusivity. I never can remember which uh, one's which, but... It does. Yeah. It, it certainly is a more terse way of representing it, the concept. Yeah, breaking out inclusivity into separate attributes is really annoying. Keep them inclusive. You can always fake inclusivity it, with the version number that you're, you know, manually writing. Yeah, but I feel like most of the time the max version you don't want to be inclusive. Yeah, but that's where you can, you know, you can fake it with 1.999.999. I would feel dirty if I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, I mean, what you're going to do here is, is, you know, the min version is probably going to be the version that you're shipping. Max version is either that version or... Um, the same major version, right? You're willing to tolerate any version that's, you know, V1, but you don't want to deal with V2. Min version's inclusive, max version's exclusive, almost always. I'm fine with that too. 
with that. I just don't want. I don't want the option. How do you specify the single version then? <laughs> We'd have to have another attribute for the single version. Um, Minver would match. So you'd be one above the max version, or not exclusive. Yeah, it's identical. Nope, it's obsolete. <laughs> it's that's a like, yeah, you can't do that. It, it would be a, it would be above the minimum, but it wouldn't be below the max. It's above the min and above the max. So it's out of range. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it's nonsensical. It's like, I guess, anything above this point. Yeah. The limit doesn't limit. Uh, the upper limit doesn't limit. Um, I mean, everything we're doing is playing games here. Like, you know, another thing would be, if there's no max version, then it's only the min version. Like, you could do something like that. Yeah, I'd be okay with that. It's a little weird having a min version be the only version. Exactly. It's a little weird. But but I think it's reasonable to say that if you don't specify a max version, that it's perfectly reasonable for a missing max version to be anything. It's also perfectly reasonable for it to mean the same. I'd be willing to accept that as long as it gets rid of the need to specify inclusivity. Yeah, I wonder in Wix 5 if we should bring the version range concept in. Absolutely. And then clean up, like, upgrade table and all kinds of things with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, shouldn't we just do whatever the upgrade table's doing? With his the four attributes? Or more if you want to include language? Just to be consistent. Yeah, I, I'm I'm concerned that anything else we do is just going to be bonkers. Like it's going to be, it's going to take longer to explain what random selection of features we chose rather than just put all the four parts in and cover the grid. It's certainly less surprising. I'm perfectly fine if the language covers the ninety percent case. Which is what we have here. Except for all the edges we just went through. <sighs> which is, which falls into the 10%? Well, yeah, the, the max version being inclusive or not? Exclu no, no. The, having, having one for the most common case is going to be, as Sean pointed out originally, and we discussed in, on Wix devs, the, the most common case is going to be an exact version match. Yeah, that, that is. That's what most people are want. It's honestly the one you should pick. So I'm okay if we we're throwing in this extra support, and I again, I like it because it matches um, the behavior for MSI packages, which is what you want when we're, we're doing the same thing, right? For MSI packages, we, we have data from MSI that lets us handle detection and we have a set of rules. This feature does the same thing for XE packages using the data that's available once you tell us how to find it. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of that. I don't, I don't feel that we have to get into the 100% coverage case. It sometimes simplifies things, but I'm a little worried that, that, just because it looks like an upgrade table, we want to treat it exactly like an upgrade table. This is how major upgrade came from, in my mind, this simple one or two attribute thing that covers the, the 80, 90% case to, oh, now we have 10 different attributes because people wanted to plug in these you know, five to 10% features. Yet we still support upgrade and upgrade version where you can get all those things. In the bundle case, that's a BA or BA function. 
But then I'm not volunteering to implement it, so that's just my opinion. What if we just did version? I'm fine with that. It's the simplest. Don't support the ranges. And just, yeah, don't do the ranges. And if you want to do ranges, you do what Bob just said. Write a BA. My assumption is that most of the time, you want a, an exact version match. Yep. Because all of the other things are really cool. Are, because almost always you want that, and not having the exact version match ends up in really kooky upgrade scenarios that are not at all what you would intend. So exact version is what you want. And if you don't want exact version, then you probably need to think through the whole scenarios, and you might need procedural code to help you do that. That's kind of where I'm ending up. Yep, I'm there. I agree. Okay. Which rolls us back up here, I think. Oh no, this didn't have version. Oh no, this has was putting the detect condition like this. Yeah. Install condition, not my version or my versions less than what is found. Okay. So this is interesting here, the less than part of this uh, install condition. Because it would be good if Arpentry did that too. Well, that's kind of implicit. Like, that's, Yeah, with the detect, detect condition, we'll do that. No. Yeah, yeah because it, uh, the detect condition will be false so or the it'll be detected as absent right so it would case, it would be installed by default right. even if a newer version is on the machine no it would be detected as obsolete if there's a new version on the machine oh it's going to do obsolete version check too and and the alternate proposal that right. we we're discussing down there oh i okay i see i missed that part He knows it was in the documentation of the attribute itself. Oh. <laughs> I skipped right over that. Um, <laughs> it's going, yeah, okay, copy, paste that in the SSD. Got it. If display version is great, uh, okay, there we go. It's absolute. All right, I see. Um, and so that still works with the single version as well? Yes, yes. It, it's actually, it makes more sense in the single version. Because you'd still want to be obsolete, even if you weren't in the min version. You know what I mean? It's like it's much clearer. Obsolete makes more sense when there's a single version. And again, it matches MSI package behavior. Exactly. I mean, that's the big win here. I keep coming back to our entry version. I mean, this is a, almost the like the tech condition that it's going to generate for you. Essentially, add, except it's also going to add obsolete checking in it. Mm -hmm. I keep coming back to the idea that you know, if you specify a tech condition, you could just override what we're doing, but it's probably not worth it. Um, I was thinking the install condition could then become more complicated too, but we can keep install condition the same and just do the obsolete checking outside of that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the versioning stuff is already something you can do in a bundle, right? Because it's it's a registry lookup, which is already well supported. The the higher order bit is the uninstall. Because right now there's no way to do that. Correct. Even in VA. Correct. So this is this is nice, you know, sugar. Yes, that's that's where I was at for most of this, is that it was like nice syntactic sugar, plus tossing it, updating the uninstall exe. Yeah, yeah. Which was impossible before. 
yeah, I, I think ARP entry with a version on it. And then I guess we can disallow the detect condition. Yeah, install condition will behave normally. Yeah. I think that's that's the 90% case for this scenario. Right? Doesn't it feel like that? Yeah. At least. At least, yeah. I think it'll be a huge ad. It'll be a really big, like, oh, this finally just works. Because it really just does not work in Burn today. And it comes up occasionally. So, yeah, it'd be good to solve that. Cool. Is there so anything else? The other considerations, like other considerations, kind of a security aspect of this, where quiet the uninstall string could be pointing anywhere. It was written to HKLM, so yeah, you, you need to be elevated to write it in the first place, but that doesn't mean you're being a good secure point of view when you decided where to put your application. True. I, but I don't see this as, as significantly different from approved packages, right? No, because it, the approved packages inspect where the actual path is, and it'll refuse to run it if it's not in a secure directory. Oh, OK. Uh, the so. only problem with doing that for this scenario is you can see uh, I, I'm thinking of, of per user packages yeah like those are in the per packages. user ARP per user packages are in per user ARP the context has to match per, per user packages cannot be launched in the elevator process Agreed. And the per machine registered packages, I think, I mean, yeah, you could register them to a insecure location. Presumably your XE elevated. So I guess the trick then would be you wrote a per machine installed HKLM key, but a per user, but you don't elevate your, you did not intend your uninstalled XE to elevate, so you put it in a non secure location. Well, but it couldn't uninstall if they did that. Well, I'm, think, I'm thinking more of the case where you let the user choose where to install your program and you're just yeah. not a security conscious person and you don't care that your uninstaller needs to be elevated, but it's going to run wherever they told it to install to. Yeah, that's not unheard of. I'd be fine if we blocked it. If, if you're running elevated and you got an insecure location from the HKLM uninstall key, it, it's not going to run. It, it will fail. Skip it. I mean, at that point, we could force it to run per user, and then they'd get a second elevation prompt. That's true. If, if we can detect that we need to block it, then we could easily do that. Just leave it on the per user side? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, it really just comes down to how much do we trust, how much do we want to trust the other package's security? Because you can't, a, a malicious actor can't do the wrong thing, right? They, a malicious actor can't get the user to do the wrong thing without having elevated. So I'm, it's kind of like, yeah, the user was already put in this situation we're not the reason that they got it. We're not the attack vector in this, I guess is what I'd say. You had to get in this situation first. That said, 
security conscious users interesting protecting them for themselves certainly is a thing we could do um that would be interesting do we know all the secure directories how does how does it tell that today i thought it had just like a limited set you can install to for yeah, a, a approved it, exe yeah it's just program files in the package cache the per machine package cache. Mm. yeah that might be over limit i don't know i don't know if anybody still puts things in windows old installers did that yeah we don't need to cater to them <laughs> okay that's fair that's fair so was it program file? You have to put it in program files or package cache? Yeah. Should an unprivileged user be allowed to uninstall a secure per machine package? Uh, no, they get elevate. prompted. I mean, they get prompted for elevation. Which could be an over-the-shoulder elevation. And then in this case that Sean brought up where the we're uninstalling an ARP entry and it's on a non-secure location, then they'll get a second or another over-the-shoulder prompt saying, hey, you need to prompt for this too, which is not a good user experience, but, well, the whole thing was not good to start with. Um, is program files and the package cache enough? Probably. Isn't that where everybody puts their things today? They put the uninstallers next to the XEs inside the program files? For for per machine stuff, yeah. Except for, Sean's case of of letting the user install to wherever they want. Uh, they put the uninstall next to the user. Yeah, they don't keep it in program files. Well, some keep it in program files. I've seen, I think install shield things have like a folder in program files where they put all of their yeah. uninstalled goo. But yeah, if you put it next to the XE, then you'll get a second prompt. I'm fine with secure by default. Yeah, I mean, if it's not that hard, then the unprivileged user might not be a member of the administrator's group. The unprivileged user then will get prompted for an elevation prompt to have someone in the administrative groups approve the uninstall. Like this is that's what UAC does. Oh, Ron. So, an unprivileged user will not be able to start any of this process well they'll get a prompt to saying hey you need to elevate please provide credentials that will let you do that um they couldn't install it in the first place either and that user would not have been able to install in the first place correct not to a per machine location okay yeah i'm not against this and if the worst case is that you get prompted again because you put it in a non-secure location at least we can stand there and go well you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably that. And we may have to extend our list of trusted locations at some point. Maybe. But I can't think of what that would be beyond the Windows directory, system directory. And to Bob's point, don't put stuff in there if you're not Windows. Yep. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, I'm dying. I have not killed this cough off yet. All right. Um, anything else, Sean? On this one? I don't think so. All right. It's not going to be easy, though. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully the version stuff makes the ARP entry easier. The single version. But yeah, it will be, it'll be cool. To have it. Are you taking this, John? In 4 up? I guess, yeah. Because the bundles need it. The bundles need to be able to uninstall using the ARP string. Mm, right. Okay. So most of the heavy lifting is because that forced it. The rest of this is able to use that heavy lifting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Interesting. All right, uh, 10.20. Let's see where we get in 10 minutes. Um, 
using shortcut property yields 1909 on upgrade to Windows. Issue number 6773. During the upgrade of an existing installation, shortcut property, a warning is always yielded. It appears the case the cause is recent Windows 10 11 updates. Existing setups that used to work fine are also affected. Okay. Sounds like a Windows bug. So Windows broke the shortcut property again? Why would this be our issue if he didn't change Wix? I don't understand. <laughs> the only way it could be Wix is if Wix wasn't doing it right in the first place. I guess, yeah. This whole warning. Yeah, this, this thing. Yeah, they've, they've always had this problem where they had all these warnings being set with shortcut properties, and it was... I, I never understood what they did to make this not work, other than it routinely had these warnings in it. I think there's like a GUID for this behind the scenes, this string, or at least there yeah. was. I remember that, and you could use the GUID instead. I mean, well, I guess... But it, it, 1909, it's failing to create the shortcut. So this this isn't just shortcut property. Yeah. I, I, I think the answer to this is uh, Windows broke something, changed something. If they find yep. that there's something we should do better in Wix, then by all means, please bring this bug back. But at this point, you know... <laughs> This warning was is always yielded. Yeah, this. Well, you probably should have dealt with the warning from the beginning. If it's been there all the time. Yeah, I don't. Know, this shortcut property stuff always has had bugs in it, and no one has a dollar. I guess it's unsurprising they broke it again. So. If they find out that we're doing something wrong in the Wix tool set, by all means, bring this back. But if he didn't change the Wix tool set, we didn't change anything. So, Right. Okay. Wow, yep. that's interesting. <coughs> ah. All right. Wix tool set data, Wix version, metadata data is wrong when invalid. According to spec, when Wix version is invalid, the metadata field is supposed to be set to the rest of the string, starting at the point where it's recognized as invalid. Okay. This would have been caught if the native test provider managed as well. The spec. If the Wix version is invalid. Okay, but we don't. All right, so I don't understand. If a well, Wix you, version is You decided to put the implementation in data, so. We need to make sure it's perfectly correct. So if, if people are wanting to use the managed version to match the native version, then it needs to set the metadata for an invalid version. But it, there's to no... The rest of the you can't get a Wix version if it's invalid today because there's only a try parse method. So is the request to have a parse method that returns the metadata field populated with the rest of the string when it can't be otherwise parsed? I guess I mean, that could be done. We could have a parse method on Wix version that behaves this way. But there's only a try parse right now, so. Yeah, but it, well, I didn't really look too close at what it returns, but it can, ret it can, s it's setting the version to a, an object. Yeah, but the, it's on a try parse, the out part of the, the out isn't, relevant if you at least that's the pattern if the try fails the out is not useful i mean we certainly could add a parse method that sets that allows it to return an invalid wix version i don't know what would use it but we certainly could do that So I, I guess we could do that. If if an invalid Wix version is parsed, then 
the metadata should be like this according to the spec, which, okay. And then there's some invalid bit that has to be set so you know that it's invalid. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, that could be added. Wix version part should not be nullable. According to spec, there's no difference between a version that's missing these versus that. And if you know the parts, you should be track it separately. Okay, track it separately. To know that a part is missing, then it should track it separately. Wait, so why should... So when we parse, we lose whether there was a three-part or a four-part version? So why don't we... All right, I think we should update the spec so that um, the Wix version can tell that there are version parts uh, not provided. And then, and then the important part, of course, is the comparison, which says that these two are equal. I love the triple equals. It's a JavaScript of that these are equivalent, because that's the important part. Because then we can get both. We can know whether it's a valid semantic version of being only three-part versions, and also then have the compare be the same. So we get both out of everything. Yeah. Uh, I think that, because otherwise it's like, you have to go write your own parse function to know, no, I mean, yeah, no. I, I agree that missing parts should be treated as zero in comparisons, totally, but I don't think we should fill in things that were blank to zero at parsing just to make someone's life harder if they want to know whether it was there or not. Um, does, is there a part, is, I forgot, invalid, is there only one invalid flag in the ver util, or is there one per label and metadata and thing? I forgot. Oh, there's just one. There's just one. Yeah, all right. I, I think I don't think we should make people have to reparse to know if a zero was provided or not. So I, I don't think that's the thing. I definitely think the comparison is important, though. We should be explicit that if you don't specify it, then we're going to treat it as zero. 1.2.3 is not different from 1.2.3.0. That would be really complicated. Um, but I don't think we should have the parsing. I don't think we should force parsing into the same space. Well, I mean, you can just have a Boolean, like, major missing or minor missing. Yeah. You could keep track of that during parsing in one go. Yeah, we should do that in the native code, too. Like, I think that's, the, that's probably the way to do it in native code. I mean, we could even use, like, the... There's the invalid thing... Uh, Boolean. I mean, we could put it in the. I mean, if we didn't want to have a whole bunch of Booleans, we could put it like a, a bit field. I don't know if that that's might be crazy. But I mean, if we didn't want to add a whole bunch of Booleans for was this set, was this set, was this set, you could just be. Um, these were all the parts that were set. I mean, I guess uh, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm confused. The the individual version values are nullable, so I'm I'm why are why are as they long nullable? as that works in comparisons, why does it matter? But why are they nullable? Why aren't they just zero if that's what it means? Because one dot two dot three being parsed is different from one dot two dot three dot zero being parsed. If you want to know the difference between them. Like if you want to be able to represent those. For example, 1.2.3 is valid semantic version. 1.2.3.0 is not a valid semantic version. We do a whole bunch of stuff, not a whole bunch. We, there's a few cases where we do four part checks on the Wix tool set, but we don't do any semver checks today in the Wix tool set. But if we wanted to, we'd want to know whether they specified a four part version. Because then we'd be able to say, hey, warning, by the way, this dot part that you put on here technically isn't valid. Or maybe we don't bother saying it, we just throw it away. I don't know, but we'd want to be able to tell the difference between 1.2.3 and 1.2.3.0 
from a authoring point of view? I mean, basically what I'm hearing is that the managed version is not supposed to be like the native version. I, I don't know about that. I'm saying that this part, I think this part of the spec should be different when it comes to parsing. I think this part of the spec is correct when it comes to comparisons. So the, I, I totally agree with this thing. 1.2.3 is equivalent to 1.2.3.0, totally. The part that I'm not disagreeing with here is that it should default all parts to zero. And I don't know if the native code should do that either necessarily. Although knowing C++, I understand why it does, because it's certainly much more straightforward to do that. Um, so do we need to push the same flexibility or knowledge in native code 1.2.3? No, do we need to know that in the native code? and do the work to implement that or not. I'm, I'm, I'm a little more ambivalent there because we don't write parsing code in native code anymore. So the important case of that scenario is less important than native code. And it's annoying to represent in native code where managed code has a straightforward represented. So that's where I, I'm not as, if you said they must be the same, then that would be the change I'd make. I'd change the native code to differentiate whether uh, to indicate when parts are missing not it, yeah indicate when parts are missing bulls or whatever that I think would be the way to do that so I think if we want to keep this the first part of the sentence is correct I think the second part of the sentence is that you know to make the managed code and native code the same then we should be able to indicate in the native code when version parts are missing. Because I don't see any reason why we should force people to write their own parser to know, again, when these three parts are, because I think that'll be us in the not too distant future. Well, in the some point in the future. How are versions compared in the managed code? They're not. That's not implemented in the managed code. Okay. I, I, I thought about it, but then I was like, uh, I, I don't need this at all, so I didn't write it. Okay. You it, can store the as fields as, as so. So Ron brings up you could bring the the values as signed ints, which is a good idea. Except that the range that we provide is the full sixty four bit space, so negative one won't fit. Um, so that's why we have to have separate booleans, or some some separate flag. Negative one won't work. Anyway, so, and then yeah, the comparison code would need has not been written in managed code yet. Okay. If if it existed and it treated the null version fields as zero, then comparison works and it's all good. If when the managed implementation of the comparison is written, it must treat nulls as zeros. I totally. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Totally. I guess my thing was this is like a pit of success thing. If you make it nullable, then anyone who uses it will need to know that they're supposed to treat null as zero. So you're just giving people the ability to mess things up. But they should use the comparison functions, which will always do the right thing. I mean, Wix versions are too hard to compare. So let me say it differently. Wix versions are more complicated to compare. You should use our functions if you're going to do it. Except they only exist in native code. Uh, the comparisons today only exist in native code. I, I, I don't know. We may need them in the managed side at some point. We just haven't done any of that kind of math yet. Well, I mean, if someone writes a managed BA and they want to do stuff oh. like that, yeah, I didn't even think about managed BA, but you're right. Managed BA is a perfect case where someone might want to do that. You're right. That would be the first case. And or an extension or something. An ex a bundle extension, not a Wix extension. No, a, a, a Wix extension. A Wix extension? That wants Maybe to they want to compare versions for some reason. Sure, right. Yeah, that's the scenario that hasn't happened yet. I actually thought I was going to need it 
honestly, when we started this. I thought I was getting all the comparison stuff. I was, I was actually surprised at um, how little of the, uh, in the end, how little was needed. It was essentially, do we need to know if this is valid or not? And that's what it came down to. So, um, so I, I, I don't, I don't know if we should change this bug or if we should close this. I don't, I don't think this is the way to go. I think instead, if we want to preserve parsing of missing fields in native code, we could do that. Well, if the managed version is doing it, then the native code needs to do it. So someone, someone needs to update the native code to keep track of that then. And it'd be much easier to change the managed code to match the native. I I don't disagree with I don't I don't necessarily agree with any of that. <laughs> there, we they don't have to be exactly the same. It would be a deficiency in the parsing code of the manage of the native code to that you'd not be able to know whether it uh, parsed a zero for something or not, and it'd just be like that's the that's the weakness. And you're like yeah okay that's fine that's what the native code does. And we never use that functionality in the native code. I think it's a very bad idea to start letting them drift apart. OK. So I, I haven't looked at the spec here. Unsigned that. Undefined fields are treated as zero. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Probably could come in and add the man. Oh, that's the burn API changes. Yeah, da, da, da. All right. I, I I don't know. This sounds right to me, unless I'm missing it. Undefined fields are treated as zero. That makes total sense to me. And the native code doesn't provide the mechanism of saying when something wasn't, when one of the major minor patch revision parts were zero. And we could change that if we wanted to make it more useful for parsing in a scenario that I don't know that we'll ever use it for that. I mean, that's, yeah, makes total sense. So do you think it's important in V4 to have the native code be able to indicate when during parsing that uh, uh, parts are missing? I mean, V4 isn't even finished yet, so I think it's a horrible idea to let them already be drifting apart. Okay, so let's, should we open a new issue or do you want to change this one? I mean, we can change this one if you want to change the native. All right, we're not changing the managed code. I don't want to lose the ability to know this information. If we do then, so the, the alternative you're talking about, Sean, is to essentially not call the thing Wix version, not be Wix version, and just go write some parse function, which we could do, right? If that's the goal, we could take Wix version out of data and go write it as some parse function and hide it completely. Like, is that the goal? I don't want it to be nullable. <laughs> it, I want it to be an int and a separate Boolean. But that, so then we'll need What's a separate parse when we need to validate that these things are valid semantic versions. Like, you're not even using that today. I, I don't understand. Like, you can just make them uints, and you don't have to change any of your code. They're already uints. They're, They're nullable uints. Fine. <laughs> But that's the important part because you can tell whether one whether the string when it was parsed was 1.2.3 versus 
How is that not important for the native code? The native code only cares. So the thing that's interesting is that the native code is extremely or tries to be extremely uh, um, uh, I lost the word um, uh, adaptable, adjustable, um, helpful. It tries to read any version and interpret it so that it can do version compares on it. Because the most important thing for the native code where it's used is to make sure that no matter what version we get, we try to do some sort of logical comparison on it that gets close to correct, right? Within oh. these set of rules. The, right? the word you're looking for is tolerant. And yes, that's tolerant. Why, and that's why this whole semantic versioning thing was a horrible, horrible idea. So the, the, where on the managed code side, right, the goal is to help the user know that they have an invalid version when they're authoring it and to get the parts uh, set correctly. So that there, they are different on those two fronts where the managed code in Wix toolset.data is much more about the build and the parsing and the user experience and the native code side of it is much more about comparing versions. Uh, Ron, I think 1.0 in your case is an invalid version. And I don't remember what the semantics are between those two. In the native code, Sean, I think 1.0 would be equivalent to 1.0.0 in the end. It's an invalid version. So a valid version is always greater than an invalid version. Ah. OK. Just a and null part. Well, no, it, it, that doesn't parse. So uh, this is an example, like on the UI side, on the UI side, on the build side, when the user's operating against something, we try to tell them, hey, by the way, that was a mistake. You typed in a mistake. Uh, the dot dot, let's give you an error message saying, hey, that did not parse. As opposed to on the burn side, if it got that number because it read it from the registry and said, hey, this is a version number and who knows how it got corrupted into one dot dot zero. The hope is that burn could would not throw up, which is what it's done in the past in some cases and just killed the whole process or whatnot. It would attempt to go forward with one dot dot zero and try to at least get to somewhere. And Sean said that an invalid version would be less than. So if you were comparing against one dot zero dot zero, one dot dot zero would be less than. But Burn would be able, at least able to continue and try to, you know, make progress on it. Does that make sense? That's how these are different. That's how their, their primary goals are different from each other. What's my definition of nullable? In this case, nullable is a field or a property. In this case, that's a null uint. So uint question mark in C sharp, nullable. And when you parse in the managed code, it will set the, uh, what's the last one? Revision, the fourth one. So if you were to parse 1.2.3, it would set major to number one, minor to two, uh, patch to three, and it would set revision to null because it was not specified. And here then it would say major is one, uh, minor is two, uh, patch is three, and revision is zero. And you could then say, hey, by the way, this is a valid four-part version, and this is a valid semantic version, because you'd know the difference between whether that fourth uh, part was specified or not. That's on the um, managed code side. So uh, let's see. All trailing fields can be nullable. Right. After the major version, all trailing fields can be nullable. Yes, that would that would be a valid version. One would be a valid version. All right, so, so option, 
arguments in C sharp, you can't omit one part of the version and then specify one. Yeah, yeah that's a that's a good example. That's a good example. Should that be explicit? Well, the try parse code is what does it. And if you pass in a string like one dot dot zero, which is not a valid version, you get back false. It's like, no, that you tried to parse this and it returned false. It says, no, you cannot. No, that's not a valid version. And it, and you're done. It's like, you don't get anything. Which is fine on the Wix side because it's trying to tell the user that it's you know invalid. And again, on the burn side, it's trying to find stuff in the world and deal with it, as opposed to just failing the whole process and rolling back. I think that's probably the, the why these two have, why that bit is, I think that's the pivot on why these two things are, um, why the nullable is more important on the managed side than the native side. But that's because the managed side is, um, um, currently only used for uh, the parsing. I think talking about explicit documentation. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I, it, I, I mean, this spec is really detailed and it talks about all the different parts and all the different ways of getting into invalid numbers and then the undefined fields treated as zeros. So it's, I, I think it calls out all those cases. Um, and then the invalid flag, which the managed code currently doesn't give back invalid, so it doesn't have that concept today. Um, and that was the previous bug we were talking about of adding a parse function so that it would parse and give you back an invalid version that you could then do something with. But because we don't have the compare functions, that I don't, I don't know what you would do with an invalid Wix version. Um, until you had those compare versions. That's where that one gets more interesting. It doesn't include your non-standard definition of nullable. I mean, that's what the issue is about. <laughs> All right, so yeah, like there's no, the managed code is not in here. Uh, so we could go in and add the managed code data to this API. Or you know what, we could just rip Wix version out of Wix toolset.data and avoid all these problems and just do the, because in the end, all it needed was the try parse. So we can tuck away the try parse away from everything and not expose the, which would only expose the, um, the checking of to make sure that it's a valid string and then we don't it doesn't do any of the you know storing invalid stuff in metadata and things like that it just gives an error message saying hey by the way or whatever it needs to do well you you needed all those fields to make sure they're not too big you needed major minor patch revision to yeah make it sure has to not over 255 yeah no it has to verify all the versions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it has to get used. It's just we can not expose it to anything. It can be totally an internal implementation detail. Because I don't really feel like fighting about this spec is really what it comes down to. The idea that Wix uh, version is going to be useful is still a bit speculative, and so I can just hide it, and then we can avoid um, having to come up with different statements of parsing because clearly the compiler is going to parse the versions differently and for different error messages than what burn would do it and then we're out of the whole problem i mean the funny thing is you're not even using whether it's nullable whether it's null or not i am like, not you that is absolutely correct i am not yet using it so we're like fighting over something that's that i'm planning to use in the future yep <laughs> and you're arguing that I shouldn't have any of those plans for the future or that it needs to do these things. So I'm like, that's fine. I will take the code. I'll put it somewhere else. So I have it when I need it in the future and I'll bring it back when I have it and we won't put it in data and it won't be part of the API of burn, which honestly was I sat and stared at it for a long time. And the whole, it's just not worth it to expose it 
in with data if if it's going to be if this is the level of things that we're worried about. Like, yeah, it's just not worth it. Okay. With a, with a speculation that I'll be able to use these things. Why do you allow two to sixty four minus one if max versions are much smaller? If max values are smaller, not all are smaller, Ron. What we found in the world is that not everything is a four part version. <laughs> I think that's that's where all of this started. Is that the versions out there are much larger and crazier and insane than we thought they would be, and so adapting to handle all of those is what we attempted to do here. You might be talking about the length of the string. But with oh, pre-release versions, oh, I don't. It, I with pre-release versions, it's uh, and metadata, you can make it as long as you want. Yeah, sorry, I just saw the sixty-four and assumed it was the really large four-part versions, which is excessive. But again, we've seen them. Yeah, those are only thirty-two bit. Thirty-two bit. Yeah, I, know. I don't know why I went to sixty-four bit. I didn't see the two to sixty fourth reference. Somewhere in there, it says the max length of the string is something really crazy. I mean, two to sixty four minus one. It's a lot. Actually, I think it's just two to thirty one. So I don't know where I don't know what that two to the sixty four minus one is. I don't either. Or I can go and update for a util to handle all of the, the nullable fields. And that's another way to do it. And it's just, and we're never gonna use that code because we're not gonna do the parsing level stuff in the version util. But we could do it and add all the extra cases for it. Unsigned 64 bit. Yeah, he originally said 64 bit, uh, but I, it, it's 32. It's 32. Well, I mean, in the native code, what if someone wants to use whether it's nullable or whether it's missing, just like in the manch code, maybe yep. someone wants to use it. I agree. It would be a great thing if it did it. I, I mean, I, the scenarios that people are going to, the chances that people are going to write lots of uh, parsing code in native code have diminished significantly. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And that's, I'm just like, uh, there is a bifurcation in the world that uh, that Wix has accepted. The parsing code and all the stuff on the build machine is written in managed code, and the runtime code is on is written in native code to have as few uh, as few dependencies as possible. And um, we try to do things in the managed code to make the native code's life easier, so we don't have to write tons of parsing code on the native code side. That's just kind of generally the space that we've come into. So um, don't reason not to use negative one as a null field. So negative one's actually harder to use than nullable um, if you want to say if it's zero. So I'm, the nullable is a very natural concept aside C sharp, so it made sense there. And then there is no concept, of course, like of the same, it's no standard concept inside the native code. And also the native code, it, it's just a difference in purposes, primary purposes. So I'm... <laughs> this is just, I'm just, it doesn't, If Wix version had a compare method, then the the spec would be accomplished, right? Because the functionality would be the same. Well, I hear Sean arguing that no, that's not the same then. I, I, I believe that's true, but Sean's arguing that no, the, that the difference between whether the native code can represent nullable or whether the managed code chooses to represent nullable for missing major minor version um, is an important distinction in the implementation. Okay. D did I represent that right, Sean? 
I think so. Yeah, and and I I don't agree that the distinction is terribly important. Absolutely important in compare, not important in parse. So when you have those, I'm not sure exactly how C sharp works. When you have your checks, when you're saying is major greater than 255, is minor greater than 255, what happens when minor is null? Um, I think it's false. But I always have to go and double check that to make sure. But I, I, I always want it to be false. And then I'm always afraid whether that's what I remember or if it's just my hope. Anyway, I have to go double check that. Ugh. I mean, if it throws an exception saying you can't compare null to 255, then this is like, this actually matters. <laughs> okay, so the, that's fair. I mean, to make sure that the, uh, the comparison checks are all valid, we definitely should do that. And that it behaves correctly. Totally agree with that. But Wix version doesn't have a compare method, so. No, there, there are cases where we compare the nullable uh, if you didn't specify a min version and we compare it to 255, we'd want to make sure that the answer came back correct. Right. Sorry. What I'm saying is that that then becomes an issue for core, not for Wix version, because Wix version doesn't have a compare method. I'm just trying to point out there might be a bug in his code that I didn't think about before. Yeah, that's fine. I need to go write another uh, test where I put into the version attribute of the um, uh, uh, package element and make sure that you could put you know, v1 in there and that everything works as you'd expect it. Totally. That bug could exist. I, I think I saw an issue coming up next that's like, oh yeah, a bind var variable could sneak all the way through and need to make sure that that works. So it's like, yeah, okay, go add that test too. So, um, yeah, no, I, so I don't agree with the bug and I don't, and then I think we could take a change to Verutal if we thought it was important to support the nullable field there, if we thought that was important. I don't think it's that important to keep them in lockstep on those two parts. That's my vote on this issue. Other, <laughs> which way do we go from here? I mean, I think so we're just going to leave everything as it is? Or were you going to move it? Or I, I, are we going to do something else? I think the issue could be, uh, I think we should keep the parsability in Wix toolset.data, the Wix version. Now, if you think it's important that we should remove it and not expose it at all, then I'd be willing to do that. Um, just to avoid the whole problem. Or accept, or we could say Verutal could change to have nullable fields in it to allow, to, to not, to indicate when the variables were not, the, the fields were not provided. I, mean, I guess for this case, I can update the naive code. Yeah, I, if you want, I don't. I still don't think it's that important, but yes. Uh, 
but that means if we're going to do that, then we should do the bug before this one. The b- bug before this one? Where it actually s- supports the invalid versions. Sure. If, if we had a parse on Wix version, then yeah, it would need to return the metadata is invalid because, uh, yeah, totally. If there's a parse function on it, yeah, it needs to follow this behavior. I totally agree with that. Well, I'm saying that there needs to be a parse version if I'm going to do the work of updating the native code. Okay. Otherwise, so, it's just drifting apart and we should just move it. Okay. I'll write a parse function in here that that returns the Wix version as per with all the fields set into the metadata when they're invalid. That seems... Because that lines us up also then for when I'm betting that can the compare functions have to come along, then the compare functions will work correctly. Or it will, yeah, they'll work correctly because all the, it, it'll be an invalid version. You'll be able to get an invalid version and uh, the metadata will contain all the fields and then the comparisons will go f- do the right thing if you compare the two inversion valid, inver- invalid versions together and have the you'll do the comparison on the metadata fields. Right? That's the way it works? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. So that would prep Wix version to be used to have the compare functions. I'm just trying to think of the value of try parse if parse will never throw an exception. Well, try parse is nice when you when it doesn't match. It, it does the invalid check for you. You don't have to do parse and then check the invalid bit. I, I mean, the, the try parse is my favorite way of parsing. It's like one of my favorite. The try pattern is one of my favorite patterns in C Sharp because it does almost what you want every time, especially now that you have out var. It lines up the code perfectly. If this is that, you know, try to parse this. Get your value out. If not, or if true, however you want, then it goes straight in the if statement. and. You're either putting out an error message or you're doing whatever you want. It works fantastically. Okay. All right, so we're gonna keep this one, but the title changes that Wix part, parts can be nullable and we're gonna indicate they're nullable for parsing. And this then is uh, we need a parse on Wix version such that when the metadata, we need a parse on Wix version that follows the spec. That's essentially what that has to be. I think and Rob, you're volunteering to do that? For yeah, six, I'll take seven, the top seven. one. Definitely, I'll take the top one because that starts moving us towards, I'm assuming we're getting into a place where we need the compare functions. And I just that's just another block of work that I've not done because I haven't thought about it. Okie dokie. It's 11. That's after 11. I think we're good. Let's see. Uh, we will pick up with one, two, three, four, and however many more open issues come along next time on that front. Other things people want to talk about? Stuff going on? Wix Clearly 3 build. Fixing things, making Wix 4 different. Sorry, Sean, you had something? Wix 3 build. Wix 3 built. Oh, right. I said if we didn't have one come out, we would do one. Yep, I will go bump that and see what more build machine decay I have to maintain. Um, but yeah, I will go bump a Wix for build, a Wix 3 build. Still did not figure out what that thing was I thought we were going to do, but that's what I get for not writing it down. It seems like if I don't write it down, I can't remember it for two weeks. All right. I'm just kind of kill time, make sure if there's anything else people want to talk about, other things going on, stuff happening. All right, so I think two weeks is 26th, May 26th. I think that's normal. So we'll be back in two weeks. We'll do all this again, pick up more bugs, continue to make way on progress into Wix uh, 4, and there will be a Wix 3 build out in the next few days, uh, probably over the weekend kind of thing.
All right. Till then, you guys take it easy. Be back in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.